Back to the action in torts, now looking at question 10. Here we get a call of the question, which is not very helpful. The court should, colon, A, deny the motion because the pipe was defective and injured the worker. Maybe yes, maybe no. B, deny the motion because the jury could find that the premature corrosion of the pipe would not have occurred absent negligence by the manufacturer. Well, that's nice and pretty detailed, but who knows. C, grant the motion because the worker has not established the manufacturer was negligent. Not a great answer, but we don't really know. And D, grant the motion because the pipe was in the petrochemical plant's possession when it exploded. Okay, also potentially correct. Uh, look at the top of the question. Worker at a petrochemical plant burned when a pipe carrying hot oil exploded. The worker brought a negligence action against the company that manufactured the, pack, the pipe, as opposed to strict liability or warranty, a negligence action. At trial, the worker established what happened and the injuries he suffered. He also presented evidence that the pipe burst because it had corroded at a higher than normal, normal rate, which according to testimony of the worker's experts, indicated a manufacturing defect. At the close of the worker's case, the manufacturer moved for a directed verdict. Okay, did the plaintiff show enough evidence there to establish negligence? Yes. He's got evidence and he's got an expert witness interpreting the evidence. So my preliminary reaction is the court ought to uh, deny that motion because the plaintiff has, got, has shown enough evidence. So, A, deny the motion because the pipe was defective and injured the worker. Well, that's potentially true, but B is a better pick because B does not judge the evidence. It gives, it puts proper the proper perspective on the roles of the judge and jury. The jury could find that the premature corrosion of the pipe would not have occurred absent negligence, but they don't have to. Maybe the jury listens to this expert and is just rolling their eyes, folding their arms. They don't like her. They don't like her testimony. They don't believe her. Okay, well, fine. Then the, then the defense wins. But at this pretrial stage, B is the correct pick because based on the evidence presented, a jury reasonably could reach that conclusion. Go to question 11, a comparatively long fact pattern, turning this into more of a reading test based on time. Call of the question fairly long. If the driver's estate files suit against the company pursuant to the permissive use statute, and recovers the full 25000 what rights, if any, would the company have against the employee? Okay, answer pick's not necessarily that helpful. A, none unless there was a written agreement with the employee that obligated him to assume any such liability imposed on the company. I suppose potentially true. Uh, it looks like we've got an employer-employee accident uh, fact pattern. B, the company may obtain contribution from the employee to the extent of 12500 but not uh, indemnity. You need to know more about the statute, I guess. C, company may obtain indemnity against the employee for the full amount. D, employee can obtain contribution uh, to the extent of the employee's relative fault. All right, well, we need to look at the facts. <clears throat> company let an employee borrow a company car for a cross-country vacation trip. Okay, so it's not being uh, used for business, not within the course and scope of business. While driving through a remote stretch of farmland, the employee decided to see how much power the car really had, it was driving in excess of 90 miles per hour, definitely negligent, potentially reckless. Came to a curve, hit the brakes, car went across the double line, hit a minivan head-on, kills the driver, and minivan destroy. Permissive use statute in effect makes the bailor of an automobile liable for personal injury death caused by any person operating the car up to 25K. Okay, that has nothing to do with employee employer, it's just a permissive use statute. Now, if the driver's estate files suit against the company and gets the full 25K, what rights does the company have? Full indemnification. This had nothing to do with the company's business. They were just being nice and said, here, you can use the car. And now they are on the hook for 25000 The employee is liable to the employer. Okay, so based on that knowledge of law, we look at the picks again and C jumps out as the correct answer. 
the company can get an indemnity against the employee for the full amount based on negligence. So go back to the top of the pits. The written agreement is irrelevant. This is a straight-up liability issue. There's no contract required. B, company can get contribution up to 12.5, but not indemnity. That would imply some carelessness on the part of the employer, none shown. Except maybe in hindsight to lend this employee the car, but no facts in advance of that to uh, suggest liability. C, the correct pick, and then D, contribution to the extent of the employee's relative fault, but not indemnity. Well, you know what? The employee is 100% liable for this accident anyway. So D is not as good an answer as C, although uh, not on its face a stupid answer. Now, let's move on to take a look at uh, question 12. Here, we've got the, uh, look at the call of the question. If a jury finds both defendants liable and assesses the plaintiff's damages at 100K, how should judgment be entered? Okay, it's a joint and several liability question, and we will need the facts to know for sure what the, what the deal is. But just based on the call of the question, pick D seems to be a good answer because we've got both defendants liable, $100,000 damages. They would each be liable for 100K subject to contribution based on a finding of fault. That's our assumption going in. But let's look at the uh, at the other picks. 50K against each defendant, 25 against owner, 75 against friend, 100K against owner only. He looks like the best pick this time without even reading the fact pattern. But let's look and see if it gives us anything different. Owner of a speedboat let his friend operate in a busy channel. Friend collided with a, with a canoe that had the right of way, hurting the occupant. Canoe assumes the owner and the friend, alleging that the friend was negligent in operating the boat, owner negligent in letting him operate it, having reason to know the friend was not qualified to operate a boat. Okay, so the plaintiff is alleging they're both careless in different ways. Traditional rules for joint and several liability and contribution, no other applicable statute. Okay, the traditional joint and several liability rules are each one is liable for all of it, subject to some finding of uh, fault based on the record. So D is the correct pick based just on the knowledge of the law. Yes? Yes, but read carefully the call of the question. If the jury finds both defendants liable and assesses the damages, so we, okay, so a reading error. Yes? A hundred, a hundred total. D is the best pick because it indicates that both defendants are liable potentially for a hundred dollars, for a hundred thousand. One hundred total because of the detail from the call of the question that the plaintiff's total damages are assessed at 100000 So if the jury, the jury could have been more specific and said, we find that there's $100,000 and that one party was two-thirds liable or something like that. Uh, well, now you see... That's how they do it, and we'll see it again. We'll see similar damages questions in contracts and in a year in real property, too. These remedies issues are important, and they're commonly tested across the different subjects. So all that stuff I was saying in class about how remedies are really a very important matter, here on the multi-state, we begin to see more about why that is. They test remedies on the essays all the time, too, 
but not as narrowly as this. Now move to question, uh, uh, let's see, that's the end of question 12. So I'll stop the recording and make, uh, and start the next chart.